Fire is an oddly unique element, even when compared to the others of the etheric wheel. Where elements such as earth and water simply persist, fire is more alive. It breathes, devours, grows, and eventually will die. It's more like a living thing than any other element. Perhaps that's why the mortal races have always felt a strange fascination with it. While an untamed blaze can reduce everything in its path to ash, a controlled fire is able to bestow light, warmth, and even cleanse. Nothing comes out of a fire the same as it went in. So what if something were to willingly temper itself with the strength of fire? In that case, you may get a culture similar to that of a certain battle-hardened people, who observe fire as the reason for their existence. Gather around, my friends, as we come to understand the lives of the Amalja and how they worship the Lord of the Inferno, Ifrit. The Yamalja are a large and semi-nomadic species belonging to the Spoken category. Located primarily in the open grasslands of Pagalthon and the deserts of Thanalan, these large, lizard-like beastmen have made a name for themselves as fierce survivalists. Because of their reptilian appearance, there are very few observable differences between their men and women, so confusing the two at a distance is rather common. Physically, the Amalja tower over many other races, with even the biggest Rogadin failing to match the average Amalja in terms of size and muscular strength. They're so big, in fact, that their hands are often just as large, if not larger, than a fully grown Lalafell. Their size gives them a very intimidating profile, something that they're more than happy to make use of when the need arises. But since they're so big, their bodies demand more protein than most other races, lending the Amalja to an almost completely carnivorous diet. They likely couldn't survive on plants and vegetation alone, so they mostly feast on other creatures like vilekin, beastkin, and scalekin. As such, they're usually not too picky when it comes to what kinds of flesh they're eating, so long as it's filling. And yet, despite their sometimes ravenous appetite, they're known to survive on very little water for extended periods of time. In conjunction with their large silhouette and feasting habits, they have a very monstrous appearance. They possess many characteristics similar to that of lizards or scalekin, and yet they are still very distinct. Their skin is very thick, and possess strong scales as well. But despite this, they never lose the freedom of movement needed to handle things like tools and weapons efficiently. Aside from that, two of their most distinguishing features are that of their long, thick tails, as well as a similarly long appendage that sticks out of their head and runs down their back, much like hair does. But unlike hair, this is one solid body part covered in the same scales and hide as the rest of their body. As expected, the Amalja take great pride in their strength, usually becoming very proficient with a form of melee combat or dangerously accurate with extremely tight bows. However, despite their muscular bodies, they're also known to become creative mages as well, even going as far as developing a unique form of pyromancy. Anyone who's lived within the arid climes of Thanalan have likely been warned to avoid the Amalja or report whenever they see large groups of them moving around Uldah's many settlements. There's a good reason for this, as the early creation of the country Beladia has long upset the Amalja, since the city-state had tried to claim what is essentially holy ground for themselves. This territorial dispute eventually extended to the country of Uldah, as both sides have remained adamant that the proximity of places like central, southern, and eastern Thanalan are theirs. But to truly understand why this grudge has lasted for hundreds of years, we need to understand the Amalja's culture and history. But to understand that, we need to discuss their fiery god, Ifrit. Ifrit has been called many things a flame wreathed demon, and immortal fire given form, and of course, the Lord of the Inferno. His worshippers would state that he is a being composed of the original primordial flame, something that could burn away both heaven, hell, and everything in between. It's from Ifrit that the Amalja credit their existence, so it's little wonder that all of them hold their lord in such high esteem. I shall tell you their story now. 
The creation myth of the Amalja holds that in the beginning, there was only Ifrit. The world that he spawned was filled with beasts bereft of reason or intellect, each fighting an endless, mindless battle for survival. But there was one race of great lizards whose ferocity so pleased the Lord of the Inferno that he bequeathed unto them flickering motes shared from his own primordial flame. This sacred fire took purchase in the lizards' souls, burning away frailty and weakness, and from the ashes of their transformation stepped the first warriors of the Amolja. Seven males and seven females there were, and from their joining were born seven tribes. It is told that the tribes ranged far and wide, and ruled all that walked or crawled upon the land. Known in the present day as Zanarak, the place where Ifrit is said to have blessed the Amalja ancestors has been a site of enduring conflict down through the centuries. Once Beladia, and now Ulda, the lizard-like beastmen will make a foe of anyone who infringe upon the blasted territory they believe kissed by the holy flames of their god. While I can't tell for certain how much of this myth is valid or not, I can confidently say that the Amalja have existed for thousands of years, easily dating back before the Sundering. But, given that story, it's easy to see why the lands of Zanarak are so aggressively defended by the Amalja. If this tale has a nugget of truth to it, this is the cradle from which they became the species we know them as today. Not only that, it's where Ifrit himself gave them his blessing. So it's little wonder that the Amalja see the presence of Beladian ruins and even the nearby settlement of Little Alamigo as blasphemous. This is quite literally holy land to their people, and they fought to keep it that way for centuries. But their religious fervor to maintain Zonorak isn't the only thing we learn from that story. The symbol that the Amalja use as their standard are three red lines arranged to look like the motes of flame that Ifrit first blessed them with. This symbol serves as both a warning to enemies and a reminder of their heritage for their entire life. But what is life like for an Amalja? Being very similar to lizards and reptiles, when an Amalja has a child, they actually lay an egg. Yes, they are in fact oviparous. But when a female lays a healthy egg, it is seen as a cause for celebration. The father of the egg will select either the finest livestock they have, or slay a mighty beast. Once killed, the clan holds a feast, with the father's offering as the main course. Everything is devoured, but the bones are collected once the feasting is done. The bones are then gathered together and burned, reduced to a fine ash in a ceremonial flame. After the 7-10 to 10 day incubation period is over, the new child hatches, and the ashes from the bones are dusted over the child. This ceremony is done to mimic how Ifrit blessed the first Amalja, as the clan now blesses the newborn. However, the bone ash serves a second purpose. The white and gray ash actually helps to shelter the infant from the sun's intense rays in the early days before their scales grow in. The child earns their given name early in life, but instead of being raised by just their parents, all young Amalja are gathered together and raised by the entire clan. As the young grow up, the clan observes what skills and talents each child possesses, taking great care to test them in certain fields to see if they are truly gifted in that skill set. These skills can be anything from fighting, crafting, diplomacy, magical powers, and even those with spiritual tendencies are not looked over. This is important, because once a young Amalja comes of age, they are assigned a place in the clan's hierarchy. In a traditional clan, there are seven observable places in said hierarchy. Each position gives the Amalja a suffix, and that name is all you need to know in order to understand what that particular Amalja is supposed to do within the clan. Firstly, there are four standard positions called Cha, Ga, Ro, and Bo, which actually means spring, summer, autumn, and winter, respectively. Anyone of the Cha become priests. They are responsible for performing the clan's rites and rituals, whether it be for battle or anything else. 
The Ga are assertive, as they are the soldiers. They're not only trained to fight on the front lines, but are usually educated in military tactics as well. Those belonging to the Ro are peacekeepers. They are well versed in the clan's rules, and are swift to deal with anyone or anything that clearly breaks the tribal law. Lastly are the Bo. These Amalja are actually builders and engineers. If something needs crafting or fixing, then these are the ones to talk to. However, those are just the standard positions. There are three tiers remaining. These are the positions of command, who each have authority over the standard roles. First are those called the Te. This position means Earth, and these Amalja are like bureaucrats. They hand down orders and oversee their execution to ensure that the clan is operating efficiently. Second is the Ko, meaning Sky. These individuals are known to be the counselors and advisors, meant to use their wisdom in order to help decide the best possible future for their tribe. And lastly is the most powerful position an Amalja can have, Zo. The Zo is considered the war chief and rule over all other positions. They are the final say and are responsible for all the lives under their command. The right of succession as a Zo is usually decided by bloodline, making them similar to kings and queens in other cultures. But despite their position in the clan, one thing is true of all Amalja. They are expected to be as fierce as a flame, and fight for their place in the world just like their ancestors did. Strength and survival is all that matters to them, as your philosophies and wishes mean nothing if you're pathetic and easily killed. Failure to be able to do something as simple as take care of yourself is seen as disgraceful to an Amalja. This is because Ifrit himself blessed them with the gift of his immortal flame, and as such it must be honored through their skills. Weakness will never be tolerated or respected under any circumstance. Which is why things have become rather interesting within their culture as of late. The summoning of the primal Ifrit and Thanalin, while seen as glorious to some, was seen as shameful by others. Of course, once the summoners were tempered, they could do nothing other than feverishly worship their false god. However, some Amalja that weren't present to be tempered and heard of what happened were outraged. The very idea of begging Ifrit to save them from Uldah's oppression was seen as beyond dishonorable. This is why many Amalja did not rally behind this false Ifrit. Instead, choosing to keep to the old traditions and honor their god in the ways expected of them. Because if Ifrit were to save them, it would mean that they were weak and undeserving of his blessing in the first place. But that, my friends, is almost all I know about the assertive Amalja. The only other thing that really sticks out about them is their skills in animal husbandry. They are shockingly adept at raising and caring for animals whether they be beastkin or scalekin, making some Amalja into something akin to a beastmaster. But I digress. While most Amalja are seen near Ulda in the hills of Thanalan, there are thousands more roaming the grasslands of Pagolthon. They mostly keep to themselves, but it's unwise to provoke them, as they're usually eager to prove themselves in battle. However, if you're strong, whether it be with melee or magic, you might just prove yourself to them. And if you do, you'll gain some powerful friends indeed. So be as strong as a blaze until next we meet. And until then, stay safe my friends. Thank you all for watching to the end. If you enjoyed this video, why not subscribe and share this with your fellow adventurers? With your help, I'll try to reach out even further, and bring even greater stories to you. Although, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my biggest contributors. A grand thank you to Papaya Cyan, Rovakis, Potato, Burn My Pancakes, The Yellow Couch, Some Nobody, Sage Mouse, Ovalisoma, Sizani, Aziri, Nahil, and Cat with an additional nod to the scholarships on screen. 
Links to things like my Twitter and that of my channel artist Caddy can be found in the description. Thank you all for your viewership, as well as your support. And I hope all of you have a wonderful day. Class dismissed.